knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. So far in this series on inorganic and organometallic chemistry, we have performed an extensive survey of the periodic table, introduced concepts regarding transition metal complexes, and the basic types of organometallic reactions. Now it is time to put all of this information together and move forward towards the primary goal of this series, to begin to understand transition metal catalysis. So much exciting synthetic chemistry that is occurring today relies on this approach, and as we may have already begun to sense from learning the basic types of organometallic reactions, it will be a huge departure from the reactions and mechanisms we are familiar with from the organic chemistry series, which are fairly simple from a mechanistic standpoint. As we know, in many cases, a chemical reaction is simply the result of the collision of two molecules with the right energy and orientation. Such reactions are called bimolecular because the step forming the product involves two molecules. An example of this would be enolate alkylation, in which an alkyl halide is attacked by the C-terminus of the enolate, forming a substituted ketone. Another example is the Diels-Alder reaction, where a diene and dienophile combine in a single step to give a cyclohexene derivative. In many cases, an intermediate is involved, meaning that the nucleophile and electrophile react but do not give the product in a single step. An example would be nucleophilic substitution at an acyl carbon, more specifically the synthesis of an amide from an acyl chloride. In this reaction, there is a tetrahedral intermediate that exists for some discrete time period before the product is formed in a second reaction. Another example is nucleophilic aromatic substitution, in which a nucleophile attacks the ring at the position occupied by the leaving group, which is then removed in the second step. But there are many other reactions that do not work, either directly or indirectly. Although they are thermodynamically feasible, meaning the overall delta G is negative, they do not occur because the kinetic barrier is huge, and they can't be carried out by simply heating the reagents. The free energy barrier is simply too high. An example would be the amination of an aryl halide. If you try to heat pyrrolidine and bromobenzene, you will not get the amination product under thermal conditions. There just isn't any kinetically feasible pathway for these two molecules to react, even though the process is thermodynamically favorable. Another example is hydrogenation of an olefin. Thermodynamically, these reactions are almost always favorable, but it just isn't possible to add hydrogen to most olefins, no matter how much you heat the system. Of course, chemists have never been daunted by such a problem. If a reaction is thermodynamically feasible, one must find a path which is kinetically feasible. The reactant will need some help by another species, which is known as a catalyst. As we recall, catalysts have the ability to surmount kinetically impossible barriers by presenting an alternate mechanistic pathway, allowing the system to take a series of shortcuts at a lower free energy, and this invariably involves navigating through a series of low-energy intermediates, eventually getting to the final product. Remember, catalysts do not change the overall thermodynamics of the process, meaning they do not alter the overall change in energy from reactants to products. They simply alter the kinetics by lowering the kinetic barrier known as the activation energy. At the end of the reaction, the catalyst is released unchanged, moving on to carry new molecules of starting material to the product. Looking at an energy diagram, the situation is analogous to a hiker who wants to get to the other side of a big mountain. After deciding that it will be impossible to get over the very top of the mountain, he hires a local guide to help him find an easier route to the other side of the mountain. The guide, who knows the mountain very well, leads the hiker through a series of secret lower elevation passes, which are intricate but not impossible to negotiate. At the end of the trek, the hiker pays the guide who goes back to pick up new hikers and guide them through his secret route again. As we can see, some of these smaller peaks on the secret route are higher than others, but all of them are shorter than the height of the whole mountain. And even if one step has a positive delta G, the overall delta G for the journey is negative, so the reaction is energetically feasible. Going back to chemistry, the important thing is that the free energy of activation for the catalyzed reaction will be lower than that of the uncatalyzed reaction, so it is simply the difference in free energy between the lowest free energy species and the highest energy transition state in the diagram. 
If you remember any of the catalysts we learned about in organic chemistry, you are likely thinking about how this is all review. We know how catalysts work. But we are about to take this concept into much more sophisticated areas. How can we get transition metal complexes to enact this type of catalysis? Again, we have already seen many of the basic reactions transition metals can do. What we are going to do now is learn how to put a bunch of them all in a row to create something called a catalytic cycle. This is much more complex than mixing two compounds and heating. If the catalytic pathway involves many steps, they all have to occur as hoped, and at the end, the catalyst has to be formed again so that it may continue doing its job. So catalysis is a complex field and quite a different way of synthesizing molecules than traditional organic reactions. Incidentally, this approach mirrors biochemistry because the chemistry of life consists of thousands of catalytic cycles carried out by enzymes, and in fact, a few of these cycles contain transition metals. To put this into perspective, let's go back to the impossible amination chemistry we mentioned and consider the reactions that transition metal complexes can carry out. How can we make the reaction work? Well, we can try to find a metal complex that reacts with bromobenzene through oxidative addition. The metal, with some ligands, which we can simply imply for the moment, will add to the CBr bond and form an intermediate aryl metal complex. Then we can follow with a substitution reaction. We have seen that ligand exchange on metal atoms often proceeds quite easily, so we could imagine a pathway where pyrrolidine replaces the bromide at the metal. Hydrobromic acid is produced, so we may want to add a very strong base B to trap the acid. Otherwise, it will protonate the pyrrolidine, and this may slow down the reaction. Finally, if this works, we can hope that there will be a reductive elimination, forming the key CN bond, yielding the desired amination product, and releasing the metal complex to carry out another cycle. If all of this works and we find the perfect metal complex to catalyze the reaction, we will have solved this problem. To give some historical context, this specific problem actually frustrated chemists for a long time, until the 1990s, when two chemists working independently found a general solution using palladium catalysis. They are John Hartwig from UC Berkeley and Steve Buckwald from MIT. This reaction is now well understood and part of the arsenal of any synthetic organic chemist. Now let's revisit the olefin hydrogenation problem. We may postulate that hydrogen can be activated by a transition metal, yielding a metal dihydride. If the olefin coordinates to the metal in a second step, we can now envision hydrometallation and then CH reductive elimination to yield the desired hydrogenation product and regeneration of the catalyst, which can then perform another cycle. In fact, these reactions have been known for over a century, pioneered by French chemist Paul Sabatier, who used hot metal surfaces to promote hydrogenation reactions. In the area of homogeneous catalysis, British chemist Jeffrey Wilkinson introduced his now-famous rhodium complexes in the early 1960s, for which he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. We will discuss these catalysts later as well, as they are still the subject of many studies and industrial applications. With these two examples, we are hopefully beginning to see the limitless potential of transition metal catalysis. So many transformations that seem impossible in traditional organic chemistry suddenly become feasible given these alternate pathways involving several of the organometallic reactions we have already learned. And chemists have been exploiting these pathways for decades now, yielding an incredible array of synthetic strategies, the most important of which we will highlight as we move through this series. But before we get to specific name reactions, we have some more basic information to cover. There are two conventional approaches to transition metal catalysis, homogeneous catalysis and heterogeneous catalysis. Let's move forward and get an introduction to these two approaches one at a time. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.